seeing the slides, right? Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everybody, to those who are joining us right now. Um, our topic today is how to recognize and overcome anxiety. And my name is April Lynch uh, from Rehabilitation Research and Training Center from the Autism Center for Excellence. I am a training and research associate, and I am very pleased to be here to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about today. And I'm Crystal Hentz. I also work at the Autism Center for Excellence as a training and research associate. All right, so we'll move into our next slide for some housekeeping items. Yeah, so before we get started today, we wanna to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. And so by participating, you are consenting to being recorded. Um, but before the session is shared, we will edit to remove any identifying information to protect, to protect privacy. So the Q&A section in the chat box will be removed and sh shared as a transcript. Um, I ask that everyone stay on mute just for sound purposes. Um, and if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box. All right, so let's go ahead and take a peek at our learning objectives for the day. So we're gonna start out with exploring what is anxiety and giving you guys an overview of that. How can you recognize the symptoms of anxiety and what that might look like? So there may be different ways of um, understanding that through self-report, observation, and assessment. We'll go into those different areas. And then we're also going to take a look at anxiety and autism spectrum disorder in comorbidity and how those uh, might manifest themselves together. We will also be exploring coping strategies because we know now more than ever, self-care is so important. And then just the idea of resiliency and how we can all bounce back and what that might look like in your life um, to becoming a res resilient individual. All right, so what is anxiety anyway? Well, first of all, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, validates that we all experience anxiety. And I'm sure we can all kind of think of different scenarios where anxiety might come up in our day to day. Um, for example, uh, the anxiety I was experiencing right before coming on this presentation. Um, we all kind of have a bit of nervousness and you know, feelings of anticipation about certain events. Um, so just normalizing that anxiety may not be a psychiatric condition, it can be something that we all experience. Um, and just to point out today, our audience may have a lot of different individuals in it. Um, we know that uh, we may have some teachers on here that are looking to get some information to better understand their students experiencing anxiety. Um, we may have individuals that are on here um, wanting to understand more about their own anxiety, um, maybe teachers that are worried about what the future may hold, and that is bringing up some anxiety for you. Um, parents feeling anxious at home about multitasking your day-to-day -day routines and schedules, um, as well as your children's. So how, um, how can we take this entire presentation and tailor it to everybody in our audience today? Um, and just kind of think to yourself, what, what have I experienced in my life that has been anxiety and, and how can I take away from these points today? And with that being said, our perception is our reality. So what someone might be experiencing may not be the same way you experience it, but kind of taking a step back and noticing that, again, everyone's perception is their reality and how can we foster that in the moment? Um, so also with anxiety, everyday versus disorder, like I briefly touched on, um, we'll give a little bit more information here shortly about different anxiety disorders and psychiatric conditions. Um, but again, it's just important to point out that experiencing anxiety may not mean that you're diagnosed with this. It may just be that everyday nervousness and anxiety that can come up because anxiety is a natural motivator and it's also our built-in cautionary system. Um, so if you think about it, anxiety can be extremely beneficial to help you achieve what you want to achieve for yourself. 
So what do the experts say about anxiety? Well, according to the American Psychological Association, anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased pressure. So maybe just kind of think to yourself for a moment, have I noticed feelings of tension in myself? Have I had some worried thoughts coming up recently? Maybe some changes in my physical um, symptoms at that time during increased pressure. So again, anxiety can be that everyday anxiety or nervousness, or it can actually manifest into a psychiatric condition or anxiety disorder. Some of the most common ones that you may see um, that also could be comorbid with autism spectrum disorder, which we'll talk a little bit more later, um, but these might be kind of the main ones that come up as far as generalized anxiety disorder. So, you know, this is what you may be experiencing with anxiety as well, but it's happening for at least six months and then continuing to manifest and increase those excessive persistent worried thoughts over time. Panic disorder is focusing a little bit more on the physical symptoms. So you're having panic attacks almost every day and this is affecting you and your physiological state. Uh, phobi phobias can range from various types. Um, and then as far as other diagnoses, social anxiety, um, there's many forms and disorders that fall into the anxiety disorder. Uh, the anxiety category. However, it's important to just recognize what that anxiety is for that person. And we're going to learn a little bit more about how we can um, understand what they might be feeling and how to support them through that. So again, we don't want to necessarily slap a label or a diagnosis on someone if we notice they're nervous. Um, it could just be that everyday anxiety. All right, so taking a quick peek at some statistics from our um, good old NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, so anxiety disorders are the most common mental health concern in the United States. Over 40 million adults in the United States have an anxiety disorder. And approximately 7% of children ages 3 to 17 experience issues with anxiety each year. So something that Crystal and I really wanted to point out here is these statistics are from 2017. So let's just think about that for a second. If they were reporting 7% of children experiencing anxiety in 2017, what do we think that percentage might be with current events and in 2020? We know that there is a lot going on um, in our day-to-day world right now as far as the pandemic and social just, justice and everything occurring around us. Um, and then of course our students, um, either in a hybrid model, virtual model, or going in person wearing masks at school. So let's just think about those different stressors and anxiety provoking events that could have led to this statistic changing. And with that being said, how can we be proactive to help those students that may be manifesting anxiety because of current events. So just something to keep an eye on as far as the statistics involved with anxiety and it increasing over time. So what does anxiety feel like? I'm sure that a lot of you out there in the audience have experienced some of this um, at some point or another. Uh, full disclosure, I experience anxiety um, almost on a daily basis and navigating it can be extremely challenging, but the first step is really identifying what you're feeling and what you're noticing that's different about yourself when you're in these anxious moments. So if we could kind of break it down into two different categories of the emotional cognitive symptomology versus the physiological symptomology. So if we're thinking about it from an emotional cognitive side, intrusive thoughts. So these are just racing thoughts coming through your mind and it may not have any specific order. It may not even make necessarily any sense in that moment, but a lot of intrusive thoughts are coming in that can then lead to catastrophizing, which is often anticipating the worst scenario or a threat or danger. And when these thoughts occur, it can be very difficult to stop them because the communication aspect in our brain, the amygdala, is alert, alert, there is trouble, there is danger happening. And this then stops the communication occurring in our brain and pauses the emotional side and is overpowered 
with these physical symptoms, but then also these cognitive symptoms that are coming through. So we may not be able to emotionally process rationally at this time, which then can lead to loss of concentration, restlessness, or even fearing, feeling irritability. Some of those physiological symptoms that could be occurring simultaneously as these cognitive symptoms, feeling dizziness. Um, often people report tunnel vision. So everything around you closes in and you just are looking straight down a tunnel and that's making you feel dizzy. And then sweating is occurring and you can feel your heart rate um, increasing. Shortness of breath is a very common one um, that you may notice in individuals at first. Um, and then some of the things behind the scenes that you may not recognize is this person is having a, a major stomach ache. Um, it, could be losing, it could be leading to muscle tension. Um, so intense uh, pain in your shoulders or in your back or through your neck. So again, this is going to be different to each individual, um, but this kind of paints a picture of what this person might be dealing with and how it's completely overpowering their thought process and their um, ability to you know, be emotionally sound um, and rational in that moment. So if we could talk about self-reporting observation and assessment, well, if you're an individual trying to understand where your anxiety is coming from or how much you're really noticing about yourself, then self-reporting these experiences can help. So um, with this particular scenario, you could, um, there's lots of different, you know, quizzes and assessments out there that you could find online, like, what is my anxiety, you know, at, you know, answering those different questions. Um, often you'll see these questions in scaling rulers. So what is uh, my anxiety on a scale of one to 10 in this scenario? Um, and a way of self-reporting and really working towards shaping your anxiety and becoming more resilient is using those scaling ruler questions for yourself and checking in at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. So this morning, uh, my anxiety might have been at a nine because, you know, I was um, anticipating this presentation and preparing and wanting to do a great job, that natural motivation and anxiety, right? But then at the end of the day, I may check in with my scaling ruler and it's going to be at a two or a three because um, I'm still slightly anxious about some upcoming events, but I've been able to um, work down to the lower end of the scale because I've done some breathing techniques throughout the day. Um, or like Crystal, I know, is doing yoga this morning. So, you know, what can you do to assess your anxiety throughout, throughout the day and self-report that accurately? Um, if we are trying to understand the anxiety of another individual, then we're either observing or we're obsessing, uh, assessing, right? So we might be using what we call evocative questions. So these are actually um, typically used in what we call motivational interviewing, which is a technique that is often used for uh, motivation and behavioral change. Um, to promote the goals and values of an individual. But I can see where these can be very helpful with anxiety as well, because let's say that you are working with a student with anxiety, you're a teacher, and um, you notice that your student is shutting down and um, you're asking closed-ended questions like, are you upset? Yes. Um, are you feeling sick? Yes. So, you may just be getting that yes or no response, but if you ask open-ended questions, you then evoke the response and you elicit that change that that individual wants. So how can we evoke those responses by asking open-ended questions like, what are you feeling right now? Um, what can you tell me about what's going on in your mind? And some of our students may not be able to express this vocally. So how can we um, provide a pen and paper to let them process their thoughts that way? Um, so just using those open-ended questions to be able to get a little bit more of a response and then to be able to comprehend and understand what that person is uh, coping with. And then finally on this slide, envisioning. So this is another motivational interviewing technique that's often used to um, help someone understand what they want to envision for themselves in a goal change way. So if I could wave a magic wand, where will I be in five years and how am I gonna get there? And what do I envision myself looking like in that five years? Well, if we modify this approach to anxiety, um, how can you envision yourself 
after you have made it through that scenario. So let's say the worst case scenario is coming up in this individual's mind. How can they envision themselves coping and working through that particular scenario um, to be successful and feel supported? Um, so again, just kind of envisioning what support they might need to be um, in the place they need to be to cope. All right, and just to add a little quote here um, from a Swiss psychiatrist uh, who um, opened up the psychoanalytical field of psychology with Carl Jung. Um, so I have my camera um, over the quote. So um, Crystal, do you mind reading it out loud? I was gonna say, I got it. <laughs> For a person to grow, we need an environment that provides us with genuine openness that enables self-disclosure, Accept, acceptance, ugh, acceptance that includes being seen with unconditional positive regard and empathy where we feel like we are being listened to and understood. My thought process with this was connecting it back to what we just reviewed on the self-report, the observation, the assessment. If we want to get the responses we want from our students or um, if you're a counselor or um, if you're a parent talking to your child um, or, you know, if you're trying to understand your partner or, you know, whatever the scenario may be, um, promoting that fostering environment and allowing that person to be able to self-disclose and then offering warmth and empathy, you're likely to be able to get the results you want and to help this individual cope through that anxiety. Okay. So segueing into our anxiety um, with ASD. So anxiety is one of the most common co-occurring psych psychiatric conditions in youth with autism spectrum disorder. Um, this wasn't very surprising to me. Uh, and I don't think it was to Crystal either. We often see um, with the clients we work with that um, there is some sort of anxiety manifesting um, and comorbidity or um, obsessive compulsive disorder often as well. So um, this is going to lead us into our next section focusing on um, anxiety and ASD. Uh, real quick, just for technical, Crystal, you're, are you seeing like the comments pop up when it's like on my end? So it's, it's not sharing that on your side, right? No, I'm not seeing that. Okay, on just making sure that people can see those slides. Um, it's telling me when people are coming in the waiting room, which is exciting. Hi, new people. <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure that it's not blocking the screen. Okay. No, you're good. Okay. So just segueing into our section of anxiety and autism spectrum disorder. Well, first of all, we really want to point out that this is an extremely individualized um, case by case scenario. So one person with autism and anxiety doesn't mean it looks exactly the same in every person with autism and anxiety. Um, there are likely going to be lots of different reasons why this person is manifesting anxiety, and we want to explore that and not um, just specifically, oh, what does autism and anxiety look like together? Um, so something we might see often with our folks with anxiety and autism um, are avoidance behaviors. So this can come out in many different forms um, for our teachers out there um, or counselors or job coaches that are listening. This may look like, um, you know, non-compliance or refusal, um, but often when working with clients or students that are exhibiting refusal or resistance, we don't want to necessarily jump to the label of, oh, this person is a resistant individual. Um, they are likely avoiding the antecedent or demand at that time because it is evoking some sort of stressor or fear or trigger for them. So if we see this little image over here, it starts with the anxiety or feeling, you know, triggered in some way, and then it leads to avoiding whatever this scary thing may be. Um, and this may be a transition to the bathroom. This may be um, sitting at the desk and starting a writing assignment. Um, you know, this may be going, you know, from one activity to another at home um, for those parents that are out there uh, working with your, your kids at home. So this scary event can then lead to that temporary anxiety that then can be temporary relieved by a coping strategy. But how can we be proactive and implement coping strategies to then uh, 
prevent this cycle of constant anxiety just being temporary, temporarily relieved. And we're gonna get a little bit more um, in depth on the supports here shortly. Um, so again, if an avoidance behavior is coming up, let's just not necessarily jump to this is a resistant individual. Let's take a step back and focus on what might be causing some anxiety. Um, what is the function of the behavior occurring here? So looking for those physical symptoms as well, if you're noticing that the student is shutting down or whatever individual we are, um, whatever situation you're painting in your mind right now, um, what are we noticing about them and what might be connecting to some of those symptoms that we talked about earlier? Um, like a student may be saying, my stomach hurts, my head is hurting um, and kind of withdrawing and not really wanting to communicate. Um, so let's let's try to notice those um, symptoms that are occurring. And then with the tantrums over very specific tasks, that's relating back to, um, again, we may be identifying this as a tantrum, but it may be the antecedent is something that we're not even aware of. So how can we do data collection and track this? How can we talk with the person about what's occurring with them? Um, and this particular example of turning the Chromebook on for virtual school. Um, so novelty can be hard, right? And especially for individuals with autism who thrive in structure. And um, how, can, how can we be proactive again and understand what might create anxiety and how we can prevent that? So turning the Chromebook on for a virtual school, we could create a visual support for that. And um, Crystal and I are going to get a little bit more into that here shortly. Okay, so real quick, just to do a little uh, case study, if you will. So Susie Q, I don't know, this name popped into my head this morning, maybe with like Halloween approaching, I was like thinking of the old Susie Q Halloween movie. Um, anybody? I don't know. So yeah, Susie Q case study. Susie Q is 18 and is beginning to exhibit, oh, sorry, Crystal, it's shutting off again with my camera in front of me. Do you want to read the case study and then I'll got it. roll through mm -hmm. it? Susie Q is 18 and is beginning to exhibit a change in breathing pattern, red face, irritability, and even tells you in an alert phrase to get away and elope. How do you support? So as writing this case study, I had a particular individual in mind and really like paying attention to what you can notice physically and what you can take in that might be happening emotionally with them. So this individual, <laughs> their breathing is changing. Something isn't right. Their face is turning red. The whole face is turning red. Irritability, their fists are scrunching up and their face, their whole demeanor has changed. So that is my signal that something isn't right. There are physiological changes occurring and clearly emotional and cognitive because of the irritability happening as well. And then, saying get away from me and then eloping or removing themselves from the area. So how do we support this? How can we navigate this moment of anxiety? Which might have been labeled as a tantrum, right? Well, we foster the fight or flight. So the symptoms manifest as the function of behavior. So again, noticing those physical things that are happening, those physical changes, that could help you identify the function of this behavior that's occurring. It may not be something particular in the environment that's happening. This is, this is a trigger that's occurring internally and physiologically. So how can we take a step back and recognize that it isn't personal, it may not be something directly in this environment, and how can we observe and support? So rule number one, first you're gonna foster by creating a safe environment. And this may mean removing items. Um, if the person is running from you, like in this particular case study, then you're following behind the individual and you're, you're giving them space. You're not hovering over them or anything. You're giving them space, but you're observing and ensuring that they're staying safe and that they're navigating themselves to a, a safe area. And then at that point, how can we focus on working towards getting the individual to a calm? It may be easier said than done, this may take a while, but how can we work with this particular individual to get the demands out the window? There is no demand at this point because let's remember back to what's happening to our brain. 
it, a threat is firing off in our brain, which is then overpowering our brain's communication system to think rationally. So how can we support them by just being there to keep them safe? without offering demands to move to a new instruction or whatever the scenario may be. And then for this particular individual, some of the individualized treatment planning that went into this or supporting um, that this individual had anxiety, but we needed to navigate it to um, help them obviously work through the behavior, but then also keep everyone around us safe and we didn't want this to continue occurring over time. So how could we put some supports in place to be proactive and preventative? So this particular individual responded um, well to the visual supports. So we can think of like a lot of people do watches now, whether it's like your Fitbit, your Apple watch, there's all different kinds now. Um, breathing on the watch. So every time it makes you know an image you inhale, you exhale. Um, and that might be timed breaks too. So even if this is in the classroom, it doesn't have to be a watch. It could be one of those little timers on the student's desk. And after a certain time goes off, they breathe for two minutes straight or you know whatever you can work out for your timing. Um, finger tapping and tracing five, four, three, two, one. This is a grounding technique. So um, how can I include my five senses into grounding myself? Um, you know, what am I smelling in my environment? What am I seeing? What am I touching? What am I hearing, et cetera? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to show you guys at the end, um, my thoughts on how to do the tape, the tapping and the tracing, um, through a certain support that you guys might want to use. And then this individual also, um, responded really well to what we call the color zones, um, for emotional regulation. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this in the form of a five point scale, um, you know, at, at one, I'm at my, my calm, and this means I am seated at my desk, um, breathing normally and focused on what I need to be doing. At a five, I am shaking, I'm up, I'm irritable towards anybody in my space. So what does that look like? And then color zones, how can you connect a color with it? This may be for our younger individuals. Um, or even some of our folks with autism that um, just respond better to visuals and color systems. So um, this particular Susie Q individual responded well to the color system and um, green zone is where she wanted to be. So green zone was happy, feeling good. Red zone is when things were out of control. She, could, she did not feel in control in any way. So all the colors in between represented different areas um, that we were able to identify based on that self-report, observation, and assessment. And then next up for this treatment planning, so using what we call a think sheet. So a think sheet is actually a form of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which we can also um, think of this as dialectical behavioral therapy because um, if you are writing out on the think sheet and then role playing this later, you're actually allowing the person to do some behavioral rehearsal and practice these skills. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit more into the think sheet in a second, but then also connecting this with stress inoculation. So this is training to promote um, the preparation for scary situations um, or you know events that may cause fear and anxiety. Um, so again, how can you help this person prepare for what those situations may feel like in the future and how um, they can navigate through them? So with a think sheet, uh, this would be, you know, a few different questions on a paper. Um, so let's think back to that case study when the person, we were trying to work to get them to a calm place. Well, once we hear that they're saying, okay, I think I'm at like a four or five, we might be able to start incorporating one of these supports in, right? To start doing a little bit of um, exploration of what's going on with them. So in the think sheet, what happened? So let's say this is post scenario where they got really upset or that they, they shut down from the anxiety. So what happened? Um, what did I do? So we can identify what was going on with them. And then some questions to the extent of what can I do next time? And how can I prepare for this for the future? So again, those open-ended questions that are gonna evoke some responses 
And then you guys are gonna take those answers and come up with a plan together to be proactive and preventative in the future, um, which then leads to having those calming and redirection strategies in place. Um, coloring, I'm a huge fan of that. That's a form of mindfulness, but sometimes when feeling anxious, um, just being able to you know, kind of relax and just let your mind flow on the page, that could be calming for individuals. Um, I know that like the new popular thing is using slime now. I really got to try this stuff because apparently people love it. Um, it's again, another form of mindfulness that can just um, ground you to your, you know, your hands are touching it. I'm here, I'm safe, you know, I'm doing this back and forth movement. Um, and again, also we know with our brain, right versus left brain, if we're trying to work on healing and working through any sort of maladaptive things coming up, um, we want to try to process from right to left and naturally create this um, calming effect. So any sort of activity that allows for that too, um, I say incorporate it. And holding ice, that was more to a grounding technique as well. Um, you know, sometimes if an individual is really hot and overheated when they're feeling anxious, giving them some ice or a nice cold cup of water and um, you know, how does, what are you noticing right now? I'm noticing my body temperature decrease. Um, so just looking at these particular examples of how this might've helped Susie Q, but how could it help you or how could it help um, those in your life that are affected by anxiety? So overall supporting autism spectrum disorder and anxiety, well, we wanna promote social and relationship skills. So we know that social deficits can be very common for our folks with autism spectrum disorder, but that doesn't mean that we can't foster it and promote for them to have successful social and relationship skills. Um, this starts with early intervention. And if we can support social and relationship skills early on, this is likely to help reduce any anxiety about future events or meeting new individuals and um, scenarios like that. Um, there's lots of different groups out there. Um, I think Crystal might touch a little bit later on one of the peer groups that we're running right now um, for adults with autism spectrum disorder. And um, it is so awesome to get to see them connect each week and share their own anxieties and um, just understand that they're not alone and that there are ways to navigate um, these anxious moments that, that come up. So with that being said, how can we collaborate with other resources? Um, you know, we all have a support team. So, so one of these resources might be that they're in a social skills group, but there's lots of resources, right? Um, I mean, my support team is my primary care phys physician, my therapist, you know, all of those people, my dentist, everybody that's on my team to support me in my mental health and health. Let's think about what resources are in place for these individuals and how can we collaborate um, to create consistency across all environments and promote that resiliency. Um, and then with trauma-informed care, we know that this approach is extremely effective um, in understanding the overall environment of individuals and, um, and their background. And you know, we, we want to promote trauma-informed care because often anxiety can manifest from past trauma experiences. So how can we understand what this student has been through, what this person has been through, whatever scenario we're referring to, um, and how can we support that in a trauma-informed care model, which promotes trust and transparency, peer support, choice and empowerment, and understanding their culture, which we know is extremely important right now. So again, we all have that support team. How can we foster that and incorporate trauma-informed care approach within that? So alerts for anxiety. Um, anxiety can be difficult to identify in children. I think this is a nice connection back with that st statistic earlier. Um, you know, in 2017, they're saying only 7% of children experience anxiety. Well, those statistics are likely to change with current events, and now is the most important time to be able to understand how you can identify it in your children. Um, so just be thinking back to those emotional and physiological changes that could take place. And then seeking therapeutic and medical advice or psychological assessment if needed. So um, 
Crystal and I are not psychologists or doctors, um, but we are here to provide this information and also offer the outlet of seeking therapeutical and medical advice if needed. Um, and back to those self-reporting and assessments, you know, you can do various forms of that on your own, but um, there are psychological assessments that lead to identifying diagnoses for anxiety. So um, seeking that advice if need be. And then just knowing that it's beneficial to implement those coping strategies and mindfulness activities, whether or not your child has anxiety. So if they're experiencing anxiety, awesome. Let's get these strategies in place. Let's cope, let's prepare. But even if you aren't noticing anxiety in your child, maybe you can take some of these strategies away today and start implementing them in the home or whatever setting you're in. Um, because again, just with everything that's happening in our world right now, we want to protect the children and, and prepare for how they can cope in these scenarios. So now I think Crystal is going to go ahead and uh, pick it up with our coping strategies and explore that a little bit more. Sure. Thanks, April. Um, so as April said, just putting different strategies in place will help the entire family, the classroom, um, whether you're a teacher or a parent or whatnot. So a big one here, especially uh, for individuals with ASD, is that routine can lessen the fear of the unknown. So just having something that you know will occur during the day, especially when we're all creating new routines at this time, um, it could even be something small as I know when I get downstairs in the morning, I'm gonna have my favorite breakfast cereal. Um, that's a part of a routine and it can make people feel more comfortable it can create less feelings of anxiety, um, especially with bedtime too, with some of the younger kiddos, uh, knowing that you're gonna have a bath before someone puts you in your, puts you down for bedtime. That is a part of your routine. Um, and one way that we can help children or individuals with ASD or even ourselves keep track of this routine is by creating a visual schedule. And a visual schedule really allows children or young adults to see what is coming next. Um, visual schedules can be made at home by taking pictures of your child, doing things like brushing their teeth or sitting down for breakfast, getting on virtual school. It can be made on a poster board um, with the pictures. You can look up pictures online. You can use words if your child prefers just to have a checklist that has a to-do list for them. Um, you could just have a simple written out list of what they need to do for the day. Um, there's also apps, the Can Plan app allows you to insert videos and pictures um, into an app form and time it. So then, you know, at 10 o'clock from 10 to 10.30, that's when I get my morning break from school. And it could be a video of the child fixing themselves a peanut butter sandwich, for example. Um, or using, if your child really likes using digital Sure, I see a question on the CAN Plan app. And we'll put it in the chat box too. Um, if April, if you could throw that in there. Um, and also like using, yeah. oops, sorry. Hey, April, it went forward on the slide. Sorry. Right. No, you're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Got too excited um, about putting stuff in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine. Um, using the notes section on a telephone or iPad or, um, on your computer, you can have the post-it notes, things like that can help just children to see what is coming next. Um, one thing that we use at my house, um, which is kind of simple is a first then board. Um, and even using that language with my toddler helps. First, you're going to get dressed, then you'll ride your bike. Um, and it helps to like get away those fears of anticipation of not knowing what's gonna happen in my day. Um, and then a major thing right now, during this time when so many things are out of our control, um, places are starting to open back up, but, you know, we're, we're still not back to being ourselves right now. So trying to take control of what you can during this time is really important. Um, eating healthy can reduce anxiety, it can reduce feelings of stress, um, and this doesn't have to be very expensive, you don't have to go to Whole Foods, but when you're grocery shopping and maybe not going as often, and so you can't get as many fresh vegetables, it can look like buying some frozen meals or fruit cups so that your child is 
kind of seen having a half plate of veggies and fruits with a protein. Um, just kind of planning ahead as well helps. I know in my household, may, writing down a list of what we're going to have to eat. Um, and that's something that I feel like I can control. So um, finding, finding out what brings you joy. So if that's going outside for a walk or if it's reading a book, um, the libraries are open now. So kind of planning the day to get in there and check out some books. So really taking, taking a second to find out what makes you happy. And during this time, how can you implement that into your day and doing it for your child as well. Um, what makes them happy? When do you notice that they feel more relaxed and try to plan in times during that day when they can have experience those feelings of joy. Um, and movement medicine, this is really, really important um, for anxiety, kind of taking a walk can really help people reduce feelings of anxiety. And right now and on YouTube, there's so many different free, free yoga, free Pilates, lots of different mindfulness exercises. There's weight classes that you can do with cans instead of barbells. Um, so finding something that helps you out and helps you be able to be active is good for yourself and it will be good for your children. Um, so this feelings chart here, it's, it's on Google. It's a really awesome tool. April and I use it in our peer group um, that she mentioned earlier with young adults. And it really helps them. We, we start the group off with them looking at the chart and they can identify how they're feeling. Um, and it helps to bring up different topics of communication and kind of draw out those feelings. Like, well, why are you feeling kind of nervous today? Did something happen? Um, and I, we love how the pictures can kind of really align, like disappoint it. Um, why are you disappointed? Was it something you were looking forward to today? Um, and so this really can be used for all ages um, because emotional regulation is very important. And we know that when you're able to identify your feelings, then you can help figure out what a strategy is that makes you feel better. Um, for example, if you know, wait a minute, I'm feeling angry you might know that taking a second to go sit by myself is gonna make me feel better. But it's hard to get to that strategy if you can't identify exactly how you're feeling. Um, another big um, thing right now, especially I think is sleep hygiene. I know my sleep has been off um, during this time of COVID, um, but Sleep and anxiety really can become a full circle that just keeps affecting one another. So we know that if you're lacking quality sleep, you may be feeling more anxiety. But if you're having trouble falling asleep, you may start feeling anxious about it and you're watching the clock and, okay, now I only have four hours to go to sleep. Now I only have three. I might as well not sleep at all. And it really can bring a lot of stress into your life. So getting control of your sleep hygiene is a really good tool um, to decrease feelings of anxiety. So just examining your bedtime routine, what's working for you, what's working for your children, um, writing that down sometimes and making, taking notes like, you know, well, we all watched, oh, my computer is messing up. So knowing that Is your screen going on, Crystal? It is, April. It's doing the same thing it did earlier. All right. So Crystal and I, I are not new to technical issues. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, so I know that right now it's still on sleep, so I can keep going, April, if that's okay, if you yeah. guys can still hear me. Okay. So we know that creating a bedtime routine can be good for the entire family. Um, and just finding what works for you, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, one thing that my son has been enjoying is doing a dance party before his bath and it gets the last of the wiggles out, it gets the energy out, it's some movement medicine, and we really do find that it helps him to sleep better. So we try to be really consistent with giving him that time. Uh, one strategy that I use as well are blue light glasses. Um, and they're really popular right now. Um, someone was telling me the other day that Richmond City Schools even included blue light glasses with their take home school book textbooks for all this virtual learning that children are doing. Um, blue light glasses can be purchased on Amazon as well and they block out 
some of the light that we're getting from screens, whether that be a computer, a TV. And so I really like to wear them in the evening. And I find that when I do, it helps me to sleep better. And then also things like lavender oils, having clean sheets, these things can all promote better sleep. Can you switch me, April? Yeah, just switch to the next one, uh, model self-care. OK, thank you. All right. So one thing that we know really helps children is for families, for, excuse me, for parents or teachers to be able to model the behaviors that you want your children or students to do. Um, so I know for our, our little kiddos, narrating a situation really helps. Um, so in the little babies that usually what we hear is, oh, you're getting dressed and putting your pants on. And that's called narrating a situation. But it's okay to also narrate stressful situations. So if you're a teacher and you're having connection issues like I am right now, it's okay to say, you know, I'm having some issues with my computer. I'm going to take a deep breath. All right, that makes me feel a little better. And modeling behaviors like that help our students, our children to be able to approach situations when they feel stressed as well by taking deep breaths or practicing other mindfulness activities to reduce their own stress. Um, giving yourself a second as well. Um, sometimes it can only be a second, which is we understand with teaching and being at home, everyone, you know, being at home more than ever before. Um, so sometimes that might just be taking a step out your front door, sitting on a step and taking some deep breaths. That's giving yourself a second. And while it's a short second, it really can help um, to protect your mental health and reduce feelings of anxiety. Um, and as a family, practicing mindfulness is very important. Um, that could be planning a walk on the weekends when everyone's home or in the evenings. Um, and one thing that we wanna point out as well is being prepared for the time to change. And that's, is this on the slide, April? Sorry. Do you want me to advance to the managing anxiety during the pandemic? I can't see the slides at all. Okay, I'll pick up with that one. So if you wanna just wrap up with self-care model, Sure. Well, um, I have the, yeah, but I can't remember what the last part on the self-care ones. You can go ahead to the anxiety during the pandemic. I did have some notes on that as well. But okay. I and then I'll have you slide. explain your apps. Sure. Thank um, you. Thanks everybody for bearing with us. Um, yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> so Crystal is explaining the modeling of self-care. Um, so important because, you know, our little kiddos don't necessarily understand what's happening. So I love what Crystal said about, you know, narrating out loud what you're doing. Like, mommy's stressed out, so she's breathing in six times. <laughs> so what does that look like? Um, also, we just really want to point out that uh, managing anxiety during a pandemic, um, we're all going through this right now. And um, like Crystal said, we want to be able to be in control of what we can. Um, so routine is everything. And how can you stick to schedules as much as possible? Um, she was noting on the first then boards. Um, we've talked about visual timers. We've talked about the visual schedule. So just kind of be thinking to yourself and vision what this could look like in your home, your classroom, whatever scenario you feel like this is fitting for. Um, so creating new traditions for your family. So going back to those values, how do they align with what you want for yourself? And how can you manage your time to not only just be productive, but to do what you love and to be happy? Um, research proves that that automatically will decrease stress and anxiety. Um, so how can you time manage your day to do what you love, but then also build in some new traditions? Um, so I think Crystal's thoughts with this was um, with the time change, like she was mentioning, and how can we adjust our schedules? Um, so maybe you know, you enjoy doing a walk with your family after work, but now that it's going to be getting darker, how can we adjust that routine, but still get that movement medicine in um, by, you know, doing an indoor workout together or, um, you know, just whatever that situation may be for your particular scenario. Um, and then, so Crystal, did you want to talk about the oxygen mask? I think you explained sure. this really well. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so putting on your, your own oxygen mask is, you know, 
sometimes it's really hard to take care of yourself when you feel like everyone around you needs a lot of things, um, but you can't pour from an empty cup. So, which I'm using a lot of uh, different descriptions, but putting on your oxygen mask means putting boundaries in place around yourself and protecting your own mental health and anxiety is going to help you be a better teacher or have more patience at home with your children. So it's really important to be mindful that while you're also making safe spaces for those in your home or the students in your classroom, that you're also doing things that fill you up and allow you to extend yourself to other people. And, and just know that we know this is hard and do what you can with what, what you have, right? Mm -hmm. So make this realistic for yourself. Um, and then Crystal is gonna go through some of her favorite mindfulness apps. Sure, so the Headspace app, they actually have a free account for educators and it has lots of different mindfulness resources that students can use with teachers. Um, and you also can download Headspace as for personal use or for use as a family or for children. Um, we have Insight Timer um, app on there and that's a great meditation app and you kind of set the time for how long you would like to meditate, um, which is an awesome resource. Um, one of my favorite apps there is the Think, Breathe, Do with Sesame Street. Um, my son really loves this app um, and I've found it to be really successful with the young kiddos and there's this monster and he gets really upset about things um, and you have to tap on his belly and help him take calm breaths and think up different solutions. And it's very interactive and it can help children go through the process of what to do when you're frustrated. I love that. That's awesome. All right. So just um, taking into account some of these different mindfulness apps that are free. Um, I love what Crystal said about the Headspace. I think that is so cool that they're opening a free subscription for school districts. Um, so go on there and check that out. So summing up our presentation today um, on overcoming, well, recognizing and overcoming anxiety. Um, well, how can we overcome it? Our main goal is to think of the word resiliency. Um, so looking at the resiliency model, um, this is how do we bounce back? How do we keep going? How do we keep being successful and effective in our life, even though anxiety is becoming a burden? Um, well, we know that internal locus of control is versus actually external locus of control. So when we have an external locus of control, we think that everything that's happening around, around us is out of our control, which may be the case in certain scenarios, right? But if we have that internal locus of control, we know that we can be successful individuals and we can overcome obstacles and challenges. And the actions that we do, the behaviors that we do can help control where our success goes or how do we achieve our goals or how do we overcome these anxious moments. So what do you want for yourself? Think, think about that self-determination and, and what do you believe in when it comes to your strengths? So doing a little bit of strengths exploration. Um, sometimes it helps to just like print out, like you can go on, there's a website called therapistaid.com. You could print out a worksheet um, with all different types of strengths and then go through and circle all of what you think applies to you. And when you're having those anxious moments, think back, okay, internal locus of control, self-determination, what are my strengths? Well, I'm resilient. I can bounce back. I've done this before. I've been in a challenging situation that I have overcome. Um, or, you know, I might see my anxiety as my strength. It may be my natural motivator that helps me keep going and help me be the best I can be. Um, so really just exploring your strengths in whatever form that may be. And that also can help you um, have, a, have more clarity on your values that will then help you kind of with that preparation of those different supports we talked about. And then also with um, being resilient, how can we thought stop any negative or irrational thoughts that are coming through? So reminding ourselves when something comes up, what facts do I have that make this real? What evidence do I have this is actually going to happen or is happening? And how can you reframe it with either a more positive scenario or one of your strengths? And 
you know, so that may be, I'll never get through this presentation today, but I've done this before and I can move through a presentation and be successful. Um, or teachers, how am I going to navigate this virtual world when I don't know what the future holds? Well, you may not have done this before, but you are resilient in other ways and you have adapted to other changes in your schools. So how can you do that again, just in a new scenario? And then how can we rewrite the narrative? So I saw a quote the other day where it said, the places that you've cried before, how can you laugh in those places instead? And that really, I don't know, it just meant something to me. Like, how can you rewrite the narrative? So moments where you have maybe had a bad experience or um, felt challenging feelings or emotions, how can you return to that scenario and rewrite the narrative to then create more positive thoughts for yourself around similar scenarios like that? Um, so how can we be resilient? Taking into account all of your strengths, what you want for yourself and your self-determination and recognizing when that negativity is occurring and stopping and saying, what is the rational thought in this? All right, and just to go ahead and sum up, I mentioned earlier with the tracing fingers exercise. So this image here is kind of um, a good way to visualize it. So let's say you're trying to teach this to a student or you're trying to learn about this yourself um, in the moment when you're having anxiety. So how can you take your finger and trace from where it says inhale all the way around the infinity sign to the exhale? Make your inhale last the entire time you're doing it. And then when you get to the exhale, begin your exhale and do the infinity. Continue repeating this about four to six times and it can re reprocess the emotional physiological symptoms that are occurring. So I ask everybody today, if you could just take a moment to breathe before you move on to your next task or your next event of the day. Um, Crystal and I have appreciated you guys tuning in and thank you so much for joining us. Um, you can do this, be resilient. Thank so just you. quickly, we'll highlight our upcoming topic. Um, so tune in on October 22nd for our next Lunch and Learn. And you can also uh, check out our vcuautismcenter.org resource page that will connect you with our future Lunch and Learns and other resources. Um, and feel free to contact us if you need some support or have any questions. And I think, um, I'm not sure about timing, but I know this leads us to the live chat portion. So. Well, we're, right at, we're right at 12 o'clock, April and, and uh, Crystal. So um, I just want to thank you both. Um, this has been really wonderful. Uh, people are posting. Thank you for the helpful information. People seem to really appreciate um, all your content and your expertise and the resources you share. So um, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank we you. appreciated it. Bye, everyone.